All right. So I wanted to welcome everyone to the Canadian Mountain Network uh, webinar. So we have an online audience and we have an audience here in person at the University of Alberta. My name is Christy Urban. I'm the Executive Director for the Canadian Mountain Network. So thank you very much to everyone attending for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we'll welcome comments and questions following each section so people in person can raise their hand and uh, we can uh, basically answer questions at that time and then online uh, we'll be going over uh, some information about how to do that in just a moment. Uh, please note that we'll be following up with all registrants through email and distributing an online form where you can add additional comments and feedback after the presentation. And we'll also be uh, recording the webinar and putting an online version of that recording on our website too. So what is the purpose of the webinar today? So today is the next step in the iterative, iterative process that we've been on since early 2016 as we work toward developing a Canadian mountain network and pursue our, our ambition of a successful networks of centers of excellence application, which as you know, is a signature funding program of the federal government uh, for national research networks. We're here to discuss our progress on the development of a letter of intent uh, and offer a forum for a two-way conversation so that we can make this proposal outstanding. April's webinar was a very big success. We had one earlier this year. And so we, would thought, we thought that we would do it again to elicit more feedback from our diverse network <clears throat> so that those who are wanting to contribute have the opportunity to do so. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Michelle Murphy, one of our communications interns, so that she can give you an overview of our webinar software called Zoom that you're using today, just so that everyone fully understands how we're able to, um, you know, ask, ask questions and whatnot. So I'd like to go over the uh, webinar software for our online attendees. First of all, please note that the webinar is being recorded and will be posted online. All attendees are muted, so nobody can hear you and nobody can see your video. However, you can communicate with us through Q&A and chat. Also, you will notice a raise hand function. Um, that is for audio presentations, and we will not be using it for the webinar. So this next slide shows you how to resize your screen. To enter full screen, you click on the button in the top left corner of your screen, or top right corner of your screen, um, and it's highlighted in red here. You can resize the presenter screen using the buttons highlighted in orange, and you can swap screens with the presenter and the presentation using the button highlighted in blue. The next slide shows you the chat function, so that is located in the top left corner of your screen. And on the next slide, we have an example of what the chat looks like. Um, it'll open in the middle of your screen if you're in full screen, you can just drag it and move it out of your way. If you're in regular screen, it'll open on the right hand side. You have the option of chatting with everyone or with just panelists and you can select that using the drop down box next to the chat. So on the next slide, this is how to ask a question. You click on the Q&A button on the top left of your screen. Your name will show up um, unless you select the anonymous button at the bottom. All questions will be read out loud unless you specify that you would like it answered privately. And lastly, if we are running low on time, um, we might wait till the end to answer questions. So thank you for your time and patience, and I will pass this back to Christy. Thanks, thanks very much. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. So I've already introduced myself. Um, I also wanted to introduce you to Matthew Berry. He's our Director of Partnership Development here uh, with the Canadian Mountain Network, and he is joining us uh, from BC, actually. He's on a trip doing his uh, partnership development. <laughs> so he's going to be joining us through video conference. And in person here at the U of A, we have Leo Storier. She is a, a professional writer, strategist, uh, grant writer, so she's going to be uh, presenting as well today. 
Okay, so most of you are really familiar with the Canadian Mountain Network, I, I think, but I just wanted to go over a little bit of background information uh, just to kind of remind uh, everyone of who we are. So we were formed uh, in January 2016. We had a big workshop here, uh, hosted here at the U of A, uh, where we brought stakeholders, partners, researchers, mountain enthusiasts together to talk about uh, is there a need for forming a mountain network in Canada, something that can represent Canadian mountains on the international stage uh, and do great work here in the mountains in this country. And it was definitely a, a unanimous sentiment that yes, this was something that was needed, it was a gap, and people were very excited to want to participate and to contribute. So throughout the last couple of years, we've been working together with local chapters, we call them initiating groups that are regionally around the country. And the question we really asked these groups are, is really, you know, what's been important to mountain communities? Where are we struggling? What kind of research is required to answer important questions. Um, part of our work was developing a mountain portal, which is just our website, canadianmountainnetwork.ca. And uh, that portal shares news. We feature an online directory of network members. And we also translate mountain research findings into plain language. So it's really accessible for um, a wide audience. In 2016, we celebrated UN's International Mountain Day. That's December the 11th, uh, with seven communities across Canada, and we'll also do the same this year. So please visit our event website, which is internationalmountainday.ca, if you'd like your uh, to post your local event or arrange an event at our mountain festival here at U of A. Uh, now we're working, of course, on a proposal in application for networks of centers of excellence, and that's really what we're here to talk about today is our progress on that. Okay, so the next slide here is about the NCE program, the Networks of Centers of Excellence program. Again, many of you are probably familiar, but I'm just going to go over some basic points that inform our conversation today. So it's a federal program established in 1989, long-term funding focusing on specific issues and strategic areas, mobilizing multidisciplinary research capacity, accelerating new knowledge creation, training highly qualified uh, people or personnel, and it's a national and international collaboration. So usually between 15 and 25 projects in three to six thematic areas, 15 to 75 professors involved in 10 to 20 universities, 50 partner organizations. Uh, so NCE funding received previously has been between three to five million a year, doubling with uh, partners cash and in-kind contributions. The call that was just made this year in August has a 25% reduced budget actually. So the funds per successful applicant this year will likely be lower. Okay, next slide. So um, with regards to the timeline, I just wanted to kind of do a quick overview so everyone understood <laughs> where we were at with that. So the call was announced in August on the 8th of uh, this year. Letter of intent is due on the 15th of November. Invitation for full applications will be in late February next year. Full applications will be due in July, so this is kind of a compressed timeline for us, so it'll be quite a heavy load to uh, put our full application together in that time. Uh, and the competition results will be finalized in October 2018. So we're kind of getting to the final stretch here. Okay, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Matthew to talk about uh, some of the changes this year with the call, as well as updates uh, from the NCE Secretariat. So we're going to switch to a video feed here. There's Matthew. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. Can you folks hear me there? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so as Christy mentioned, I'm just going to provide a few updates about um, this specific NCE competition. Uh, so until recently, our discussions of research themes have remained relatively broad in order to accommodate the possibility of a specific focus of the NCE competition. With the announcement of the competition and its guidelines, we are now able to narrow and focus on integrative research areas, as will be presented later. The funding envelope for this competition has been reduced by a quarter from the last round to about, uh, or not about, but to $15 million per year. It's likely that this amount will be distributed to three or four networks. Unlike in previous years where the competition was limited to new proposals, in this round established networks whose funding will expire in fiscal 2017-2018 may also apply. 
However, they will be held to a different and higher review standard than new network proposals. As per the recommendations of uh, the recent federal science funding review, the program is encouraging SHRC, uh, so Social Sciences and Humanities uh, Research Council, relevant networks, smaller networks, and networks more focused on policy innovation as opposed to technological innovation. There has always been a focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion within networks, but this has really been emphasized in this round. Some other updates are that uh, unlike in the last competition, there will be no requirement to list participating researchers and their bios in the LOI, other than the two co-research, other than your, your research directors. Rather, we'll simply provide an estimate of the number of researchers that will participate with a longer list of names and theme leads to come as part of the full application. Since the last competition, new rules from SHRC and CIHR, Canadian Institutes for Health Research, also provide the opportunity to fund organizations directly without having funds flow through a tri-council eligible researcher. This would have to be negotiated with the U of A as the host institution, as they would retain financial accountability for any such funds, but this could assist in delivering community-based research projects, which has been a big part of our conversations in developing this proposal. Additionally, the NCE program is working toward a model where networks can work with the most generous or relevant provisions of any of the three funding councils expenditure guidelines. One council will be selected by the network for formal administration, but practically they are not involved in any special way as the NCE secretariat remains the primary contact for evaluation and support. Finally, it is our understanding that the best and perhaps only way to populate the full application is through a mock call for proposals that could help identify projects to fund in year one. All selected projects would need to be rerun through the, for, through the formal NCE process if the full application is successful, including the Research Management Committee and Board of Directors. As a result, the mock call application would be designed to be less onerous than in a regular full call. During the full application stage, we'll discuss specific methods to launch such a mock call, as well as plans for subsequent calls during the life of the network. And so those are some of the changes and considerations that we're looking at for this round. Thanks, Matt. Are there any questions in the room here, first of all? No? Um, yes, I have I apologize for being late. Um, you may have already gone through this, but what I, is this the same process as the joint, um, or as the application that Ainsley Elkin was promoting? The UConn. UConn College, and this is all the same. I believe so, yes. yes. Is she on the call today? Um, I, I don't think so. They're going to be reviewing the recording, and there's an initiating group meeting for UConn on Monday as well. Because okay. I'm from UConn. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, any other questions in the room? Any other questions coming in online? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. Okay, so uh, the letter of intent to the different sections. So there's multiple sections. We're gonna be addressing most of them today. A couple of them, as we're finalizing our budget stuff, uh, you know, we'll be kind of making them a little bit um, more populated. So we're not gonna go over those things today, but we will be talking about our vision, management of the network, uh, research excellence, network, networking and partnerships, the highly qualified personnel program and strategy, uh, the knowledge and technology exchange and mobilization piece, and a financial overview. So um, the support letters, we certainly have a strategy toward doing that, but like I said, we won't be talking about that too, too much today, maybe a little bit in the financial overview section since they're linked. And then there's an overlap section that we, again, have some work done on, but it's not really complete yet. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna go over that piece, but there'll still be a lot of info today, as, as you'll see. <laughs> okay, the network vision, the next, next page here. So uh, we've been working on some visioning stuff and there is certainly a section um, uh, with the letter of intent uh, on vision. So Canada's mountain communities and environments are resilient and resources are sustainably developed through the collaborative strengths of research um, and the knowledge and wisdom of local and indigenous mountain peoples. So the idea of this vision is what state do we want to leave the mountains in so to speak with our, the impact we're trying to have uh, as the Canadian Mountain Network, what is our research going to result in? And, and uh, a, a mission statement would be more specific about how we're actually going to get there. And that is partly um, addressed on the next slide. 
which is our overarching objectives. So this is a little bit small, I apologize. I'm just gonna kind of go through them because I think it sets the stage for what we're uh, gonna be talking about in the rest of today's webinar. So kind of our, our uh, objectives throughout are to um, adopt inclusive, co-designed and interdisciplinary solution-based research programs, understanding past and present human and natural influences on mountain environments, and facilitate improved forecasting of future conditions, embracing practices that include indigenous partners, the bi-directional flow of knowledge and the role of strong research partnerships in reconciliation in mountain places, emphasizing partnership-based and community-led research acti activities that incorporate multiple ways of knowing and support the development of local capacity, incorporating mountain individuals, communities, and governments, including indigenous ones, into network governance and decision-making, developing a hub for Canadian mountain research that links mountain interests with people and partners and providing access to a research data management platform, the Canadian Digital Mountain Observatory that connects mountain research and analysis. Expanding the terms um, highly qualified personnel and mentors so that mountain communities have access to a more diverse range of employees able to support their needs. Mobilizing knowledge into local, regional, and national, international decision-making and policy. And finally, leading the development of models and tools that improve risk and change management and enable integrated land use planning across sectors often viewed as competing. So sorry for just reading that through, but I did want to give you guys a really good sense of both the vision and these um, following objectives. Any questions on the vision stuff before we move on? Person, no? And online, there's nothing yet. Sometimes with these webinars, you get so many questions and other times we just don't. So, um, but as they say, there uh, will be an online forum that people can ask questions after the fact as well. And there'll be a recording too. Okay, so the next section is management of the network. And we're gonna pass it off to Matthew again to go over this section. Great, oh good, you guys, can, you guys can unmute me from there. Thanks very much, Christy. For um, the management um, section, I'm just gonna start off with the um, NCE, LOIs, uh, and NCE LOI guides description uh, of this section. So we're asked to describe the proposed management and governance structures for the network, including a one-page organizational chart, which you can see on your slide. Uh, we also need to provide information about the nature and level of involvement of partners and stakeholders in the management and governance of the network, in particular with regards to strategic planning and the design and execution of network activities. We also need to briefly outline the administrative and operational structures of the proposed network with regards to coordination of activities, setting schedules, monitoring the network's progress towards its strategic goals, and allocation of resources. So our proposed org chart here reflects our analysis of the governance structures of all current NCEs, the advice of our steering group and advisory council members, and discussions with NCE experts to ensure alignment with current best practices. If the full application is successful, CMN would incorporate as a board-governed federal not-for-profit. The board would be recruited not only for various skill sets, but also to represent the diversity of the network's partners. It would be primarily tasked with the evaluation of the network's management, approving projects, audits, strategic planning, and annual reports. Three standard board committees include an executive and nominations committee, a finance and audit committee, and an ethics and conflict of interest committee. We are also proposing an Indigenous Advisory Council reporting to the board to provide the opportunity for an Indigenous majority voice in CMN strategic planning, program design, and implementation. Membership could be open to all interested Indigenous representative organizations, and this would be in addition to the more limited opportunities for representatives to serve on other bodies, including the board, research management committee, work teams, theme working groups, or as theme leads. And later in the presentation, we'll talk about some of those in further detail. For the management of CMN, we have proposed a collaborative leadership team, including an executive director and two co-research directors. AgeWell, which is a current NCE, pioneered this model with two co-scientific directors based in Toronto and Vancouver as a way to reflect diverse sectoral and geographic interests. In our case, we feel that research director is a more appropriate title in encompassing our embrace of both traditional knowledge and the humanities. 
The first co-research director will be Dr. David Hick, Professor of Biological Sciences at the University of Alberta, who is uh, presently in Australia. Um, David's research interests are focused on the ecology and dynamics of mountain and cold region environments, impacts of climate change, and determinants of social ecological resilience. For the past 30 years, his work has focused on boreal and alpine ecosystems, primarily in Yukon. Previously, he held the Canada Research Chair in Northern Ecology and recently launched a Mountains 101 course in collaboration with the U of A's Zach Robinson. We are currently recruiting the second co-research director in advance of the LOI submission, who will be an individual with strong leadership credentials and long experience working with Indigenous research methodologies and approaches. The co-research directors will guide a research management committee that includes the chairs of the five work teams, as well as our theme leads. This body will provide recommendations on calls for proposals, grant approvals, and other programming to the board of directors. We will not create an expert advisory committee reporting to the board of directors, which was a traditional NCE practice. Instead, we will follow the new best practice of the BioCan RX model, another current NCE, which is to improve engagement with third parties and international experts by adding these individuals to the research management committee itself. This improves the efficiency of the network by eliminating an extra committee and reduces conflicts of interest by only allowing third party members of the committee to vote on grant approvals. We will evaluate potential theme leads during the full application stage as we further refine the research agenda. Our steering group has approved a model of co-theme leads, which would bring diverse voices and experiences to the table, including different disciplines, junior researchers, professionals, and indigenous leaders and traditional knowledge holders. Each group of theme leads would have a theme advisory group assisting them in developing their research plan. Also reporting to the research management committee are five work teams tasked with developing programming that is cross-cutting. These work teams will focus on training and education, research data management and information systems, knowledge and technology translation and mobilization, research platforms, so this would include things like research stations and other infrastructure, as well as consortium management. And we'll talk a little bit about that consortium opportunity later. Finally, the executive director will manage the following functions included in the administrative center. These functions will be allocated to positions in the full application stage, depending on priorities and available resources. They include scientific affairs, partnership development, indigenous partnership development, communications, training and education, governance and corporate operations, consortium coordinator, regional liaisons, data management, finance, and events. And again, those are not all discrete positions. Those are the functions that we need to have represented within the administrative center. So I can either take questions or I will pass it on to Leo for the next slide. Were there any questions online? It doesn't look like it, eh? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, this is great. Um, I, I have been up here a couple of times uh, in the past, and uh, I've had the, the privilege of uh, being able to work with the team as a writer uh, to put together uh, a variety of materials that we have needed um, over the past year and a half. So I've been asked to, dis uh, to talk a little bit about the excellence of the research program. This is a very, very important section uh, within the letter of intent. It's probably the largest section in the letter of intent. It, it typically takes about 40 to 50% of the entire uh, text associated with the letter of intent. And they are looking uh, really for a sense that, uh, that there's a focus, that we recognize that we can't do everything for everyone, but that we can pivot uh, and that we're flexible. Uh, that we can grow uh, over time, that we are coherent uh, in the approach that we take so we don't have disparate things happening in, in, in variety of places and scatter research around, but that we really do have a focus uh, for what it is that we wish to accomplish, that we're aligned uh, with the various partners uh, that we have, uh, and that we have real connections, uh, connections where our partners play roles within the research projects and programs themselves so that we really truly have that ability to build capacity on both sides of the research you know the academic and non-academic uh, communities and most importantly we have to add value 
we know already that there is mountain research in Canada, you know, that hasn't been ignored. But what we need to do is we need to be able to bring that together to create a coherency, to create partnerships, to grow, uh, not just incrementally, but take some leaps and bounds in places where we really have strong priorities and where we haven't been uh, as successful or as responsive as we need to. And from our partners, we know that that's a very important part of what this NCE can provide. Uh, underpinning that is the, the, the need to, um, the, um, here, can you change it to the next one? Underpinning that is the need to um, uh, ensure that people are heard in the process and that we build the knowledge in a coherent way so that it's accessible to people, not only from academia, but throughout the mountain regions, right? To policymakers, to communities, okay? So the way that we want to do that then is to um, take the three core themes that we have and which I'll discuss in the next few slides, uh, places for life, sentinels of change and elevating opportunities and build them alongside the principles of inspired voices and building knowledge. So those will underpin all of the work that the network does. They aren't just separate on the side, something that we, we do research in and, and we think is important, but that they really are the pillars of how projects are chosen and how uh, information is shared and how partnerships are developed. Okay? In addition to that, we um, have a focus on uh, three modes of research. The first is the traditional approach that academia has taken in, in the past and which is, has been found lacking in terms of the relationships and the capacity of building opportunities that exist within the communities that actually use or need this information. Uh, it is initiated uh, by researchers and supported by CMN partners and it will continue to be an important part of the network. Uh, but we will now be moving towards what we call modes two and modes three, where we now have partnership-based research, which is initiated and led and supported by multiple partners, so not just from academia, but maybe from industry, uh, from government, from indigenous peoples, from various interests that exist within the mountain regions uh, and who can lead and want to be participating in research itself okay so those projects are co-developed they're co-designed and co-produced by multiple partners and uh, are the next step from taking it from the academic sphere to the community we would like to take that one step further and move to what we call community-led research where we can support research that's actually initiated and led within the communities uh, and by community-based researchers. So not necessarily academic researchers, but non-academic researchers or experts, uh, citizen scientists, for example, who can take a uh, research initiative and build it into projects and then work with CMN to make it happen, okay? These ones are developed, designed, and produced, particularly by Indigenous and by community partners of the CMN, okay? So that is the philosophy of research uh, within the network, okay, underpinned by bringing the voices together, inspiring people to participate uh, and share uh, and to hear what's, what's happening, uh, as well as building the knowledge platforms that we need to, to develop, okay? So that is our, our context for research within the network. So Pierre, if you could move me to the next one. <laughs> We now have, uh, as I discussed, the three core themes within which research will be focused. Uh, the first of these is Sentinels of Change. And the focus here is on forecasting and mitigating change prompted by human, climatic, and environmental factors and develop the plans and policies needed to manage the socioeconomic risks that are associated specifically with hazards and changing water resources. So we've had to focus We've had lots and lots of feedback from various groups and partners. We know that there are enormous opportunities. We also know that we can grow and that we can pivot and we can build 
uh, to, to um, also grow and support further research, but we have to be focused and we have to be coherent. So within Sentinels of Change within the next five years, or at least within the LOI and, and the proposal that we're anticipating putting forward, those would be the areas that we will provide focus on in terms of doing research and change. Okay. If anyone has any questions about that specifically, nothing? Is it possible to have more examples related to human situations? To human situations? Such as uh, health-related situations? So in the, in the next two slides, there'll be some, some things related, but we can also uh, share some more explicit documents with you too. Okay. Um, if you need to get the next one, ah, places for life. All right, so the second core theme, uh, the second core research theme is uh, places for life. Uh, within this theme, we are going to look at Canada's rich cultural mountain heritage and the resources so that we understand what the impacts of change, social change particularly are, that we can define what community resilience looks like and build the relationships needed for reconciliation. Um, the issue of human wildlife coexistence in the context of mountain biodiversity and habitat connectivity is also studied to support resilience of life in the face of the socioeconomic pressures that are increasingly uh, affecting and acutely impacting, uh, sometimes profoundly so, uh, mountain regions. Okay. So the two main areas are, as I noted, the richness of cultural resources and heritage, emphasizing Indigenous history and presence in mountains, and the unique mountain biodiversity with a focus on habitat connectivity and managing human wildlife coexistence. That, that's our initial start. We have to remember that uh, NCEs in the past, they have to show focus, they have to show that coherence, they have to show that it's doable and that we're not taking too much, but we are allowed to change. Uh, some NCEs, uh, some networks have changed three or four times, their visions have changed, the opportunities have changed, and that's a lot dependent on the partnerships and the opportunities that arise. So I want to make sure that people do understand that there's flexibility within the model uh, that the NCE program uh, has, has established. Okay, all right, the next one. Elevating opportunities, and, and Matt, you may have to, uh, you know, uh, jump in here and, and save me if I if I get jammed up because this is Matt's special um, area. Um, so this last theme is uh, very entwined with the other themes because, of course, uh, opportunities in mountain regions are very impacted by what's important, who lives in in communities, and uh, one of the critical things that we've heard is that land use planning has to integrate risk and the competing needs of the public and private sectors and respond with sustainable plans, policies, and practices. If we're going to achieve our vision, we really do need to make sure that there are the outputs that allow us to manage risk uh, change and apply that to land use planning um, activities. Uh, th this will be supported very heavily by the uh, municipal consortium. Uh, that is being established. So we're really looking at uh, doing integrated land use planning across sectors that are often viewed as competing. So for example, uh, natural resource development, uh, tourism, recreation, and also recognizing that uh, we have to maintain environmental and, uh, bio and resilience and biodiversity as well. Okay. Any questions for me? Is the focus on providing tools to support land use planning or to be involved in land use planning? I think, on that, um, you may be able to answer this well, but my understanding is, is that, uh, that, that there, there is a real need uh, within communities to do land use planning that incorporates quality information so that decision making can be enhanced, uh, that uh, evidence based uh, policy practices are, are developed. So, and Matt, if you want to ask. Sorry, could you, could you just repeat the question in the room there, Leo? Um, I guess because my familiarity is in the Yukon, um, whenever a term that's all encompassing like land use planning comes up from our research or from a network like this, I'm always curious about how the network sees itself 
being involved when there's legislative and treaties that already cover land use planning? Like where, have, have you thought about that interface and how that would be presented? Yeah, well, so in the Yukon context specifically, um, yeah, this is an area that has been identified and for sure you have some of these legislative frameworks or agreements, but now there's a lot of interest in the actual uh, implementation and, you know, particularly the, the knowledge and, and understandings required um, in order to, to get down to more granular levels within these high level frameworks. So I think that's a part of it within that unique, con unique Yukon context. Obviously, you know, land uses are, are very diverse across mountain regions, across Canada. And so this will be uh, uh, much more flexible. Really the reason that we landed on this as a, as a topic within this research theme is, you know, there's a hundred you know, there's a hundred things that were proposed for, for every area of this, but within this elevating opportunities piece, rather than trying to pick out any one or two specific sectors, we said, boy, you know, what is everyone coming to us with that is held in common and that is very integrative with some of those other theme areas that, that Leo mentioned? And it comes to the fact that mountain landscapes are often areas where you do find these intense competing land use pressures. And so what are the ways that communities are most effectively uh, navigating that and negotiating that? And what is the information that is required to inform some of those policy decisions? So another specific example I will give you is the decision in Alberta to create uh, the Castle Provincial Park. That was a, an important political decision, but now from sort of an operational perspective, there are a lot of other questions around co-management, around, around um, different recreational uses, et cetera, where it's been indicated we could help to flesh out um, some of those pieces that follow from those high level decisions. Thank you. Okay. So with that, uh, unless uh, there are uh, any additional questions, um, uh, someone else is going to stand here and uh, <laughs> discuss. Well, actually, it's Matt. Matt, I, I have to introduce you for, for the networking of partnerships, which of course is uh, essential to the success of what I've just been talking about. Matt, now. Perfect. Thank you, Leo. And I am unmuted. Excellent. So again, I'll just start with the NCE program description of this section of the LOI, which says that networking is critical to promote effective interactions and collaborations between all stakeholders for the goal of the beneficial application of knowledge. Networking and partnership activities should be designed to generate solutions to the challenges the proposed network will address. Identify the key proposed partners and explain the role of each partner. Summarize the history of partnerships with complementary organizations and detail how the proposed network will build on these partnerships and accelerate the development of the proposed network. Discuss existing linkages and the network's proposed strategy to build new linkages and indicate the anticipated level of support from sources other than NCE funding and as well the associated strategy. So clearly a little bit of overlap there. So I'm going to condense a bit. Um, as this is a grassroots initiative, we are developing all of CMN's partnerships essentially from scratch. Obviously, we benefit from not only our own prior networks and partnerships, but also those of all of our members. And, you know, we are mobilizing those existing connections and integrating them into the proposal. So when I say from scratch, I mean sort of from a formal organizational perspective vis-a-vis -vis the Canadian Mountain Network. It's not to say that there are not you know, many collaborations existing within the mountain research community. However, unlike other NCE proposals that may come out of a research center or institute, we don't have that same base of existing funded activities and programs and those existing formal partnerships. Um, we will look to the NCE grant and partner contributions to develop this capacity over time. And obviously, you know, as you've heard today through our, through our team, through the, uh, through the strong support of the Faculty of Science at the University of Alberta, we've been able to start to do that to a certain degree. Uh, I will speak to the budget and anticipated support later in the presentation in the financial overview section. So for now, I'd like to highlight some of the key partnerships that are reflected in our anticipated letter of support, um, which the NC Secretariat has indicated should be the focus of this section of the LOI. Keep in mind that we're still in discussions with partners and that this is a preview rather than a presentation of results. We estimate that our network now connects 56 uh, governments, indigenous representative organizations, industry partners, nonprofit organizations, and research institutions from across Canada and around the world. Obviously, these are a small set, subset of those extensive relationships that I'm covering in this slide, many of which will be referenced in other sections of the LOI or in the full application. 
including companies, museums, community foundations, and academic or not-for-profit research institutes. So we are seeking the support from the seeking support from the Alberta, BC, Yukon, NWT, and Quebec governments that at this stage uh, we hope will be focused on the administrative tools required to ensure that the residents are informed and engaged in CMN opportunities, including research leadership, governance, and programming. Uh, as part of the full application process, there will be additional opportunities and requests related to that research program and other, other aspects as well. We have several Indigenous representative organizations participating in our steering group whose letters will speak to the aspects of the proposal that align with their priorities and needs and that represent practical examples of how to build stronger Indigenous research partnerships through governance, funding, and, important, and addressing important research topics. The network and my tax, which um, originally started as an NCE and originally started with a focus in the mathematical sciences and has now expanded much more broadly in terms of its programming, but also in terms of being very cross-disciplinary uh, through the three tri-councils. Um, together with them, we're exploring collaboration on their new Indigenous Communities Engagement Initiative, which focuses on building research projects based on the self-identified needs of Indigenous community partners with students acting as the mechanism for cooperation. In addition, CMN's private sector network will be mobilized to co-fund eligible partnered research projects with the MyTax Accelerate program that some of you may be familiar with. And this is getting back to, again, you know, we talk a lot about these indigenous partnerships. That is, of course, you know, a very unique and interesting part of this proposal, but we, but we very much have a strong focus as well on all of the traditional mechanisms to support, um, um, you know, to support other kinds of HQP. Um, so by no means is, are we limited to that focus. The network will seek to represent Canada as well for the first time in the United Nations Mountain Partnership. This organization facilitates research partnerships and joint action and advocates for global sustainable mountain development. We are also exploring partnership development opportunities with the National Science Foundation's National Ecological Observatory Network and with the University of Central Asia's Mountain Societies Research Institute. And then finally, I mentioned here, or we have listed here the Municipal Consortium, which I will speak to in the uh, next slide. I can start though, before I get there, are there any questions, uh, if we just go back, thank you. Uh, are there any questions on this slide? I'm not seeing any specific ones in the chat side. So if there's nothing in the room. One question. Oh, sure. Um, I can't remember the name of the US organizations, but I'm thinking like the uh, Northwest Boreal, um, network in the U.S. and the Arctic network uh, led in the U.S. based in Alaska. I think the Northwest Boreal is also based in Anchorage, Alaska. Have those been um, connected with it? There's probably similar ones that are based in the states out of Washington and Oregon. Yeah, I don't, I don't think those specific organizations through our network, just knowing the kinds of members that we have involved and researchers, there would be connections to those groups. What you're seeing here is a snapshot, which is, a, again, a prioritized snapshot of the organizations with whom we have very strong relationships today who can, we think, put forward um, good letters of support with very sort of concrete um, histories or records of helping to build this proposal, as well as the ways in which they will contribute to it going forward. So absolutely, I just wanna emphasize, this is not any kind of an exhaustive list of our partnerships. These are the folks who are gonna be working together with, hopefully, to get some letters of support at the LOI stage, and then in the full application stage, you know, we're going from 10 pages to 100 pages or whatever it might be. We can we can flesh that all out. Um, that also reminds me, when you look at this list, obviously there's more organizations here than there are five, uh, which is the number of letters of support we can provide. So we're looking at potentially putting together some, some joint letters of support by sector as opposed to organization to try to reflect that diversity of the membership. Um, and I do see from Sean, just to finish up one specific question, he says, the Torn Gat seem like an emission here. Uh, any partnership with Newfoundland and Labrador, um, similarly for the Indigenous partnerships in coastal Labrador communities. Uh, answer to that, Sean, I have been in touch with um, the Labrador Institute 
at uh, Memorial University. And I believe, unfortunately, David couldn't participate in this call, but I believe that there are some connections uh, through ITK and through Nunat Siavut government as well. I'm not sure, uh, you know, that they haven't, they're not members of our steering group, so they haven't been as engaged in that respect. And there are a number of other Indigenous communities, um, not only there, but also in Alberta and BC and Yukon, et cetera, that obviously aren't reflected here. And the reason for that is because for the letters of support, we are focusing on those um, representative organizations who have served on the steering group and therefore can demonstrate that this isn't just a love letter, this isn't something we're asking for at the last minute, that these folks have actually been a part of the decision-making process for the, for the network, and that's why they're highlighted there. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So the next piece, and again, this is one of our letters, and this is a uh, program that meets a lot of the different, or not meets, but that is relevant to a lot of different research, training, and knowledge mobilization considerations, and it would be with under the umbrella of the broad Canadian Mountain Network. So the Canadian Mountain Municipalities Consortium is a proposal to connect elected officials and key municipal staff to mountain research, and a program that will help connect CMN more broadly in mountain communities to other businesses, not-for-profits, etc. Based on the successful Canadian Municipal Water Network, of the NCE-funded Canadian Water Network. The consortium is a program that over time could become self-sustaining through member and associate member contributions, provided it can demonstrate value. Members will commit their time and resources to develop a shared priorities report and commission research, training, and knowledge mobilization projects that respond to those priorities. They will meet annually to network, share best practices, review project outcomes, and plan for the next year. We are working on details with prospective members, but at a high level, they would provide a member contribution towards administrative costs, and we would then allocate a portion of the NCE grant toward the funding of their selected projects. And again, this is based on that uh, Canadian Municipal Water Network model that's been, that's been quite successful. Um, are there any questions on this part of our proposal? Perfect. All right, well then in that case, I will pass it on to Christy to discuss our HQP and knowledge translation and mobilization plans. Thanks, Matthew. Okay, so we'll go on to the next slide. So we're gonna be starting off talking about uh, the development of our highly qualified personnel programming. And here I just have our strategic approach kind of outlined, but I do wanna read out a little bit of what the uh, letter of intent guide expects for this section. So outlining the strategy to capitalize on the network structure to develop highly qualified personnel, describe the network strategy to expose HQP to the full range of economic, social, and ethical implications of the network's activity, activities by involving them in all facets from the initial research discovery to its practical application, explaining the added value of the proposed HQP training activities, discussing how the network will enhance HQP capacity and career opportunities in relation to the needs of partners and stakeholders and the current knowledge experience gaps that exist. So we do have this, uh, our strategic approach. And um, you know, one of the main objectives for our programming is also to expand the definition of what an HQP is. So uh, you know, we're not going with sort of the traditional, you know, just someone from academia. We're also going to be including potentially youth um, you know, and, and other, other types of uh, community individuals that would fall under, fall under our new defined definition, uh, as well as using mentors. Um, who are not necessarily academics to uh, help provide the training as well. So with regards to our approach here, we have uh, reconciliation and research partnerships course. So that's one of the first activities we'd like to, to put together. So available to all HQP and mandatory for academic HQP. This first of its kind course co-developed by Indigenous and academic partners will cover the cultural histories um, of Canada's mountain people and places in the strong uh, research partnerships and reconciliation uh, and the role of strong research partnerships and reconciliation in mountain places. This two day course will be offered three times per year across Canada by the network, network's indigenous partner, partnership director who will engage local experts and elders. Digital recordings will also be broadly available. 
Uh, the second, a uh, massive open online course. We're all pretty familiar with MOOCs, I think, at this point, starting with our Mountains uh, 101 MOOC that we um, have put together over the last few years. So the network, CNN, will develop a MOOC focused on mountain society and culture that builds on U of A's hugely successful Mountains 101 class, which uh, is, is physical, biological, and human dimensions of mountains with uh, uh, over 18,000 learners since January 2017. Um, and Indigenous Canada, which is another MOOC um, as well here uh, out of Native Studies. So um, this new MOOC we're proposing uh, would be available to global audiences for audit or credit. The course makes a major contribution to understanding Canada's mountain peoples, their challenges and priorities, and raising international awareness. The third strategy would be a volunteer, voluntary cultural orientation program, and it will provide funding to local liaisons to orient academic HQP to the community and encourage two, the two-way flow of knowledge uh, during research projects. The flow, uh, this flow is an, an important part of building local capacity and trust. The fourth strategy is a series um, of portable mobile labs. Oh, I think I've got confused here. Uh, here we are. Um, which could include things like a 3D map of Canada's mountains uh, along in partnership with the Royal Canadian Geographic Society and potentially a multimedia storytelling lab that provides academic and non-academic HQP with the training and equipment needed to share their knowledge and experiences through filmmaking, drama, or art. Um, we actually have one that I didn't list here, I think, which is internships and scholarships. So, I'll just uh, mention that now. So we will enable mountain youth and academic trainees to work directly with the network partners uh, in government, including indigenous, industry, academia, and local agencies. They will expose H2, HQP, for example, uh, to local culture, research, and, uh, and its application, decision-making, and policy development. These investments uh, build skills, networks, and employability uh, for mountain-related careers, CMN's private sector, Network will be mobilized to co-fund eligible partnered research projects with um, the MyTax Accelerate program. And uh, number, let's see here, number six, um, yeah, is our partner funded HQP grants for training and certification programs. So designed for both academic and non-academic HQP, these partner-funded grants provide training in necessary skills such as safety, first aid, business and leadership, uh, data management, curation, and scientific communication through local partners, through local providers, pardon me, and experts, so guides, archivists, etc. Um, they support HQP uh, participation in the network projects and prepare them for employment. Okay. Uh, and then one uh, last one here as well, I think it just got cut off, is our network AGM and conference. So um, it's not listed, I apologize. So these events will allow HQP to attend and participate in workshops, strategy meetings, and plan uh, panel sessions on such topics as cultural awareness, current and priority mountain research, uh, and policy, knowledge translation, and change management. So international um, attendance links HQPs to projects, employers, mentors, and diverse perspectives. So do we have, does anyone here have any questions about the HQP programming? Quite a lot of things, but I think there's a lot of really interesting opportunities that can come, come from this and certainly develop over time. Any questions online? Not on this. Okay. All right, so our next section is on knowledge and technology exchange and uh, mobilization. So uh, in the past, it's been exchange and exploitation. <laughs> so we've changed it to mobilization, which I think makes a lot more sense for our network. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to read again from the program guide, uh, just so you guys have a sense of, of what, uh, what this section is, was expected from us. So. NCE networks are expected to create social and economic benefits through the application of evidence-based knowledge generated from research. Uh, this includes a range of activities from those encompassed in knowledge mobilization, 
to those encompassed in commercialization, which doesn't necessarily have to be part um, uh, of, of NC, this particular NCE, for example. Um, it is not necessary for networks to cover this entire range of activities. To be effective, these activities require the involvement of partners and stakeholders um, applicants are expected to demonstrate that the appropriate activities will be undertaken and that the appropriate resources allocated to maximize the benefits to Canadians. Okay, so again, we have a strategic approach here um, of how we're going to address uh, this section. So number one, mobilizing knowledge uh, into the mountain research partner advisor govern governance and user communities through the mountain portal. So again, CanadianMountainNetwork.ca, Canada's first mountain research network and information exchange service. This portal already hosts a network directory that link links 56 organizations interested in mountains. It communicates updates and research summaries in plain language, provides new newsletters and leverages social media through including iTunes, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter to share cont content and Instagram. <laughs> CMN and partner co-produced podcasts will connect mountain communities and researchers and share their stories with the public. Select episodes already include doing research in the Satu region in Northwest Territories and building partnerships in research um, with partnering with Yukon. Uh, partner and network news, funding calls, HQP opportunities, programs, and event information will also be shared here. Number two, create the Canadian Digital Mountain Observatory, Canada's first major effort to bring together decades worth of mountain research. It will build on the interactive map and photo-based mountain legacy project and will provide access to both raw and processed data sets. Visual and database, data-based modules will make research and analysis publicly available. The system makes a growing body of mountain research available to local, national and international users. Number three, facilitate and support Canadian Mountain Network's recently established, or what will be established, uh, municipal, Canadian Municipal Mountain Consortium. Uh, there is a thirst for evidence-based decision-making in these dispersed communities, but a limited capacity for accessing the latest research and using it. The consortium will focus on identifying research priorities, and work with researchers and community leaders to share knowledge and transform it into local solutions and policy. Together, they can leverage their resources, experience, and knowledge to solve challenging mountain issues such as hazard risk management and the impacts of change on mountain communities and biodiversity. Number four, facilitate um, uh, annual knowledge exchange events. So in celebration of International Mountain Day, December 11th, and again, our event website is internationalmountainday.ca. So in 2016, as mentioned previously, we had um, partner communities coming together with nearly 3,000 people attending these celebrations. This was for the first time in Canada that we had we've done this celebration. Across the world, there were celebrations previously um, that we weren't really unified enough here in Canada up until last year to really um, start to celebrate this uh, on a group scale. And I think going forward, this is one of our strategies for um, translating knowledge to, to people across the country. Um, and then another uh, uh, option as well for an event is the uh, Network Annual Conference, which will include presentations, workshops, and panel discussions on translating research into policy and best practices. Local and international leaders will be invited to contribute to these efforts. And number five, draw on the network's expert and Indigenous advisory teams to create a set of formal research policy and processes so that the KTEM activities, gotta love the acronyms, <laughs> also build capacity and empower mountain peoples and communities. Okay, so again, that's a lot of, a lot of things we're doing here, but I think it does really link into our HQP training uh, and also to our research program. So I hope you guys are starting to see this as a sort of a system we're creating. Any questions? Nothing online? You can save them for later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So I will pass it over to Matthew for um, to speak about uh, the financial stuff. Perfect. Thank you, Christy. 
So within this section, according to the uh, NCE guide, within this section, we are to provide a table of anticipated expenditures, anticipated non-NCE funding sources, and an explanation of, me, of each of these tables. So our total budget, including part, our total projected budget, including partner contributions and the NCE grant, is forecast to rise from 3.6 million in year one to $5 million in year five. As you can see from the graphic, the NCE program has provided an expenditure template within the budget section with the following categories. Research, which will include logistics, supplies, and salaries for students and other research participants. Knowledge mobilization, which will include events, policy development, applying new technologies, and other activities. Networking, which will include seminars and workshops, our annual conference, communications, and other activities and administration and operations, which supports the salaries and travel of administrative center staff and the network's board and committees, along with other miscellaneous costs. Um, you know, I would emphasize here when we look, you know, when we look at the way that the NCE program has laid it out, there's a lot of pieces that could go in one category or another. So I wouldn't worry so much about the specifics of what's sort of been labeled as, as knowledge mobilization versus networking uh, in particular. I think there's a lot of crossover between those two sections. So more I would look at it at the higher level between how we're proposing to allocate between administration, research, and, and those other two categories. Um, and this is actually a, a vast improvement off of the uh, LOI table for the last competition, which was focused on very specific line items, which how would you even know at this stage, um, you know, as you're trying to put together a budget. So it does at least make some sense to be able to indicate, okay, for our, for our proposal at this stage, this is where we want to emphasize our activities in terms of, again, research, knowledge, mobilization, et cetera. Uh, we are targeting an NCE grant of $2.5 million per year over five years for a total of $12.5 million in federal funding. This is less than what we had anticipated prior to the announcement of, this, of the NCE competition, for those of you who have been involved with us for a while now, but it is a response to the reduced funding level of that program, the eligibility of existing NCEs to apply, and the increased competition that we anticipate from that, as well as our discussions with the NCE secretary regarding the ranking and approval process. So, we can talk more about the strategy, but that's, that's where we've uh, landed at this point in time. Although the NCE program is not a matching grant program, the expectation of the NCE Secretariat from their recent webinar is that networks will get to a one-to-one -one match by the end of your first five years which we have provided for in this budget. Um, note that additional federal funds have been reserved for renewal competitions in which the network can receive an additional two terms of funding if it demonstrates the value, it, if it can demonstrate the value that it is creative, created and a future need. The historical grant, so in this case 2.5 million, would be the minimum amount, but it's not clear if the amount could be increased in the second or third terms at this point, as this would depend on the program's available resources. But just a reminder, this is for five years, we're focused on five years, but the NCE program is meant to provide at least the opportunity for funding up to 15, 15 years. You will note from the slide that early on, the expenditures are weighted towards research, which would include support for our research data management platform, and which also provides the opportunity to support longer term or more expensive research projects. These can include community-based research projects that need a, a, a longer time frame to establish and to, to do their work, or more capital-intensive projects. As time goes on, the absolute and relative NCE portion of research funding goes down as we establish our credibility and use the NCE grant to leverage partnered research funds, either at a project level or through a partnered call for proposals. Um, an example of a partner call would be uh, Irving Shipbuilding with uh, Miopar, which is a marine uh, NCE based in based at Dalhousie, and they provided, I think it was $500,000 or a million dollars uh, to say, you know, we're looking for research in this specific area, the NCE fund matches that, and, and away you go. So it's, it's one effective way of, of, of uh, leveraging those outside funds. Um, it's also worth noting that year five NCE funds must be used by the end of that fiscal year year, which encourages shorter term projects and a focus on knowledge mobilization in year five. As you can see, the knowledge mobilization and networking costs are expected to grow along with the network's growing administrative capacity, network reach, and the opportunity to promote research outputs. 
The projected administrative and operational costs are determined by the NCE cap of 15% of its grant, which I think is uh, 375,000 uh, in and around there for uh, a $2.5 million grant, as well as our efforts to secure support for additional administrative positions from partners, such as an Indigenous Partnerships Advisor, as well as regional liaisons in Yukon, NWT, Alberta, BC and Quebec, as well as other supports. Of the 1.2 million in non-NCE revenues, or sorry, I should say, we expect $1.2 million in non-NCE revenues for our first year of operations, which would be April 2019 to March 2020. And of that, we anticipate $550,000 from provincial or territorial governments, $270,000 from post-secondaries, $300,000 from other miscellaneous partners, and $80,000 in own source revenues from uh, events or workshops, for example. Are there any questions on the financial overview? I think that's it, Matt. Maybe not. Okay, perfect. Okay, so everyone's had a chance now to listen to us talk here for an hour. Um, this is an opportunity for any discussion or questions. Um, we have an hour left in the webinar. We may take 15 minutes if there's just a couple questions or, or we can take longer. So I would open this up now. If nobody has any questions and uh, there should be some that come up, uh, once again, we, we will have the online forum on our website um, and we'll be distributing it to everybody here as well through email so that you know where to put any thoughts or feedback, ideas, wanting to partner with us, wanting to participate in the research program, suggesting uh, research type projects we can use as, as examples. If you have statistics that can support our research program, we'd love to know those. Um, any other types of tidbits that we would try to get information on, you know? Uh, it's, yeah, we're, we're doing fairly well with a lot of the, the statistics uh, that, that we've um, uh, collected. Um, uh, there isn't really anything right now that I can think of, you know, that I've, I've got a dire need for that would strengthen the proposal beyond. But uh, if, if people don't mind us putting that, that question potentially out later, um, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. If it's still on Friday, you might hear from me Thursday evening going, oh, we have an internal <laughs> I'm <missing> <laughs> We have an internal adjudication here at U of A on Friday, so that's what that was in reference to. But the LOI itself is not due until November 15th. So we are working toward um, getting a really strong draft of the full proposal, which I'd say we have probably 60-70% done already in uh, October. So that's where we're at with that. And, uh, lots of bits and pieces, but it's really coming together. But we still are looking for people's inputs and, and wanting to participate. And Christy, it's maybe worth uh, also mentioning that although the formal submission goes in November 15, uh, practically will be finished before then in order to move it through the sort of U of A signature process. Yes, exactly. So as a, as a I, was, I thought I had mentioned, but perhaps I missed it. So kind of middle of October is when we want to have that final draft due uh, for, for that exact reason. So. Uh, we have an in-person question. Where do you think your weaknesses are right now? Then? Um, I don't really know. I feel pretty confident uh, in terms of the KTEM and HQP programming stuff. Um, I think it takes a lot of time. We spent two years developing the research excellent piece, excellence piece. So I, I think we've we're still in the refinement stage for that and getting the right wording. So I think maybe on that side, making sure that it's really excellent and we've taken the time to keep iterating on it. And, and part of this process is to share where we're at with our partners to make it even better, right? So I think that to me is a, is a place where we could still maybe use some ideas or input. I can make a comment on that too, Christy, actually. Yeah, just because, you know, we're, we're having a lot of these uh, conversations with partners and they ask a, a similar question, which is a really fair question. And I think, you know, our starting point as the Canadian Mountain Network is something that we all, I think, realize is um, very valuable in that it's very broad, it's very interdisciplinary, but for that same reason, it's also a challenge, right? I mean, if we were the Canadian Avalanche Network, it's very easy to know who needs to be involved in that, you know, who are the right people to talk to, what's the research agenda, et cetera. But because we're the Canadian Mountain Network, um, I think that is a, is, a, is a more difficult question to answer. And because of the delay in the call for proposals from the NCE program as well, I mean, we only actually received the formal announcement August 8th. 
And now it's been a very quick turnaround to put together this this LOI. And, you know, although we had sort of been, you know, it had been hinted to us that there wasn't going to be any restriction in terms of the the theme areas that would be funded through this competition, that was always a possibility. And so up until the competition came out, we had to stay at a fairly high level um, in order to potentially pivot to any kind of a focus area coming from the NCE. That didn't actually happen. And so now we've been, uh, I guess, empowered since August to say, okay, here are the hundred things that we could do. What are the different pieces that will, um, meet federal priorities as a federal funding program. Where are there existing research centers of excellence that can implement this agenda? Uh, what do people want to co-fund, et cetera? And, and then once you get those answers from that still fairly large group of, of, of potentially good topics and, and theme areas, how do you choose the pieces that will integrate well with each other? And so from a weakness perspective, I would say, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to pull that together. Uh, we've had relatively limited time. And so I think we're all looking forward to the full application process where we can really then flesh out within this research agenda, um, maybe what more the more specific opportunities would be. So that's what I tell people at least. Mm -hmm. I have one idea to strengthen the proposal from a strategic vantage point. And okay. I offered this input in that spirit. When you talk about the, is it three modes of research, mm -hmm. a lot of the traditional humanities, the classic humanities and fine arts fall within the first category, traditionally. Mm -hmm. And I think you can be careful to value this style of research so that it remains open to investigations that, and scholarship that take place in realms of knowledge as diverse as philosophy, music, and history. And this would be a strategic advantage because as you stated up front in the news, there will be emphasis on shirk related scholarship. Mm -hmm. And I think you're very strong on the science and the science discourse and paradigms, but you could potentially bump up and strengthen even more by valuing that area of research and that mode of research. So you're talking about the researcher led mode one, right? So I, um, I, I'll speak to that a little and maybe Leo might have some thoughts too on that. So from our understanding, you know, most of the research being done is kind of this curiosity led research. So I don't think, or researcher led research. Um, so I don't think that part is, that's gonna certainly continue to be huge percentage of the projects that happen. I don't even know what percentage, but very, very over 50%, I'm sure. What we're saying is let's open the door to have, to encourage some of the other kinds of modes as well. So I don't think that we're just saying we're gonna do 80% modes two and three or something like that. It's just opening the door to some new models, adding kind of an innovative element. I'm happy to hear that, and I think that's a, a useful caveat to when presenting a description of those three different modes of research so that we do not inadvertently diminish one compared right. to the others, because right. depending on the situation, they would all have strengths and weaknesses Absolutely. in their epistemology and ontologies and their methods. Absolutely, and um, you know, we've even heard from communities too, it's not always the case that they have the budget to even be part of it. They may want the results, <laughs> but they don't, they don't, they can't participate for whatever reason. So I think on various levels, mode one is certainly valid. And, and maybe that's something we can talk after the fact of maybe, you know, you having a look at, you know, some of the pros we have to see if it, it, it reflects kind of where you're coming from as well. Any other questions online perhaps? Yes. Yeah. So the first one is on network governance. Um, and it is, is there a goal or target to have indigenous representatives on other committees? Also, how are student interests, excellence of educational experiences be addressed within this structure? So okay, Matt, would you feel comfortable answering that? Sure. Yeah, so for the first question, I think the answer, and sorry, I just wrote down, so the goal for target on committees. Um, I think we could certainly consider, you know, some kind of a, 
uh, percentage target. We're not going to know how many seats are involved in each of these different structures uh, for some time, but that's an important consideration, I think, going forward. I think the answer is probably not for the for the LOI, but within the full application, um, we could look at that. Um, and I would refer back to part of part of the conversations we had were that yes, it's important to have throughout the network structures, um, indigenous representation. So that will definitely be a part of it. And so, you know, to the question, at what level is that? Is it a is it a specific percentage allocation of seats or how does that look like? Um, I think we, we have more discussions to get there. But out of that conversation also came the importance of this indigenous advisory council that reports to the board of directors. And the goal for that was to create an indigenous majority uh, voice within the network because one of the concerns that we heard from some of our partners who participated in these structures like a research management committee or the board of directors is well it's great to have people on those on those committees if it's only one or two in the context of 10 people and it's a majority vote type situation um, that can be diluted and so this indigenous advisory council was um, considered to be you know, one solution for that to really put forward a strong perspective um, on the HQP side I think that absolutely it's our intent to integrate um, integrate those voices within these different different structures um, um, whether that's you know um, through the research management committee or a board seat or whatever it might be. I don't think we're at that level of granularity um, at this stage, but um, that is an important uh, reminder. Okay. We have another one. So with respect to, quote, resilience of mountain communities, unquote, Willis explicitly acknowledged that conditions in many communities not immediately within mountain landscapes are influenced both directly and indirectly by what happens in mountains. I got a bit lost in the question. Could you repeat it one more time, maybe a little louder? Sure. With respect to, quote, resilience of mountain communities, unquote, will this explicitly acknowledge that conditions in many communities, not immediately in mountain landscapes, are influenced both directly and indirectly by what happens in mountains? Yes, I definitely, I definitely think so. Our, our whole understanding, you know, mountains are a system and they certainly have a lot of downstream effects for people. So I absolutely think so. Did you want to add anything? Uh, and, and certainly um, that's been built into various sections um, of the letter of intent <laughs> drafts uh, that have been prepared so far. So absolutely there is an understanding that uh, there are impacts uh, yeah. from mountain uh, change, for example, that will affect what the resilience of uh, communities that are downstream. Yeah. Then we have another question on the scope of our research. Um, the themes are all about humans and mountains. How would research in mountains that are relatively less studied and with less human changes, such as the Mackenzie Mountains, for instance, be included? Um, so NCEs are really about addressing challenges you know, for Canadians. And so that's why we spent the last couple of years talking to community members and a variety of, of Canadians about this topic, including from academia. So I guess I would just answer it that this particular part of Canadian Mountain Network, so the NCE, if we get it, will just be a piece of the, pie, of the whole pie. It won't be the, the entire thing. So we're really trying to focus here on um, meeting the challenges of mountain communities. And that has an environmental factor, a social factor, an economic factor, um, and some of these other projects that maybe don't address the needs uh, more specifically could be funded in a different way, perhaps by a municipal consortium or, or you know, if we get other consortiums pulled together, uh, we could have funding for, for those pieces as well. But as Leo mentioned, we have to start somewhere. We have to be strategic. We want to get the NCE, and so we need to kind of, you know, really answer the call that's been given, which is about these challenges. Do you have anything to add? Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> and then we have one more. Would installation of new sensors and collection of new data, example from satellites, be part of the mountain digital information system? Or is it focused on compilation and synthesis of available data information and knowledge? That is a very specific question that I don't think I have the answer to myself, but we will note that one down and, uh, and get an answer to it unless Leo or James probably have no idea. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, I think it's difficult to speak to <coughs> specifics, but, but fantastic people who think outside the box. And, that, and that's really what I envision the, the Canadian Digital Network to do for NSC being able to do. I think of uh, 
I have three abilities in my head. I call them, I think, of flexibility. So this is a platform that's going to be flexible, steps outside the traditional, what we think of as a data repository. Uh, as per se, we will take all sorts of different types of, of data, including indigenous knowledge. We can think of temporal and spatial and the roles of cult. I think of the, 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 it's wide open for what it can do. Uh, then I think about interoperability. It needs to be something that can uh, speak to different types of platforms, that different languages, be able to, to, to do things that we can't even yet uh, really know. Right? So being able to do that interoperability. And then there's sustainability. Uh, and that's uh, hugely important because we have to think beyond you know, even just the immediate funding platform and, and, and the future. Uh, and so as much as we can, we want to tap into uh, things that are, for instance, open source uh, in terms of being able to bring those in. The HQP piece of it has a huge place there. So, um, so again, I think when we get to the full application, we'll get to a little more of some of that granular detail. Uh, but at this stage, there's a, you know, there's a lot of, I think, promise to, to what it can be. And, and it's great that we're uh, querying you know, all of our different types of partners and stakeholders, researchers, regions. It takes that to build something uh, of that magnitude. So stay tuned, and hopefully we'll see some pretty good things coming out uh, as we move forward. Thank you. We actually have a follow-up question on less research mountain landscapes and specifically the Mackenzie Mountains. Um, so the funding will not apply to the Mackenzie Mountains. Oh, I wouldn't say that it wouldn't apply to a specific, any specific mountain. I definitely not, but we want to address challenges that Canadians experience. So I guess we would have to know what specific kind of questions they would want to include. And, you know, if they were eligible, potentially we could even put them in the LOI's examples too. So if that person wanted to send an email to us, um, then we can certainly respond to that directly. The SATU, just to add to that, Christy, the SATU Renewable Resources Board sits on our steering group. So yeah, by no means are the Mackenzie Mountains not, uh, yeah, included within our, our, our scope. Right. One more question in the room here. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's it's really important that, um, I, I appreciate the person online, their, their curiosity about where and when places are really remote and there's no one living there and they're rarely visited of how much attention those would get. But I think it's really important in this proposal that communities are the focus and, and research priorities that are identified and brought forward by communities. So whether those remote places are flagged or not flagged, that some of that direction is back on the communities, not individual researchers' interest in going to those really cool remote places, um, which is often the driver. And I, I understand that too. Um, but I was wondering how, and I think, um, I don't, sorry, I don't, brought up some of the, the humanities and that part of it, that seems to be, um, I'm not too sh I don't know where you feel your focus is now, but it seems it is on the biologically driven questions and the in local geomorphology and, and those process driven questions and the but maybe not as strong on the humanities side and connecting it to policy development in northern a lot of these mountain areas are in northern regions and, and northern issues, remote issues, and that requires someone who has a really strong foundation or a team that have really strong foundations of policy development, humanities linking to land use planning, linking to um, helping governments move forward and be more adaptive and, and all of that. How, I mean, I'm curious how strong you feel those skills are and expertise are in this proposal and the steering committee and the, and the folks that are involved now. How strong are those skills? And, and then I wonder if, if you would think about having that co-director co of research as a strong humanities focus and, and recruiting someone who has that strong humanities focus. Yeah, um, I definitely don't want to give the impression that this is just an NSERC um, application, not, not even close. So the fact that this maybe came across a bit that way, I think maybe that's some work we have to do in our documents to, to, to make that uh, and more clear that you know we definitely have a, a strong SHRC focus as well. And I think uh, I think there are a lot of opportunities and as we go through creating these five pages we need for the research uh, excellence piece for the LOI, you know, we have to definitely, I think, maybe be a bit more explicit on, on that side of things. Um, Matthew, I don't know if you want to add a, a bit to that as well, from the, especially from the elevating opportunity side. Sure. 
Yeah, well, so I guess there's a couple comments. So one from the policy development piece specifically within our steering group, we have three provincial and territorial governments represented. We have uh, three uh, um, um, indigenous representative organizations who are all, and then through this Mountain Municipalities Consortium, and there's been a lot of interest there. These are all the policy makers and decision makers who'd be collaborating with researchers. So they have been very engaged um, uh, from the start, I think, in, in the development of this proposal. And I think that that is, is one of our strengths, is that the way that we've built this thing and the way that we will continue to build it is not only a focus on the researchers, but also when we're designing the research agenda to have it be coming from these knowledge end users. And that's a, a broad overarching point that's very important to make, I think, about the NCE program, which is that it is a, a, a program that is based on two two major criteria. One is that it's uh, solutions oriented, so social and economic problems facing Canadians. And we have to demonstrate that, that our, our programming um, can, can provide those solutions. And two, it's a partnered program. So when you go through the call for proposals process, for example, um, as a researcher, or if you are a, 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 an organization and then you recruit the researcher, however that happens, you need to demonstrate uh, that you're able to build those partnerships and that it's not just something that's interesting to a researcher. It's not just something that a community cares about and there's no one available to help them from it, from that research side. It's very much about these collaborations. And so it's not, you know, we're going to provide the overall framework we're going to provide some direction through the themes and we're going to provide some funding and, you know, assistance with networking, et cetera, but it won't be for the Canadian mountain network necessarily to take any one project and, and, and be able to advance it. That's not our, our, our role. Our role is to, is to facilitate the project proposals that come forward. And so it's for everyone who's involved to keep in mind how you can be successful through, through that process. Um, so that's just an overarching, overarching comment because this is a distinct kind of a program and an initiative from maybe other funding projects where it is more just sort of interest-based for, for the researchers. Um, another comment um, just on the elevating opportunities piece, and this is in response to uh, Harold, your, your comment there around elevating opportunities and maybe an overemphasis on the land use planning piece um, and a recommendation that there could be something around innovation and best practice for sustainable community development. Um, you're right. I think, you know, the language that we have there uh, maybe made it seem like it was maybe too restricted and overly focused on land use planning. So that supplementary sort of broad um, mountain community sustainable development uh, focus, you're right. It needs to be more explicit in there so we can, we can uh, work with our text to make sure that comes through. Any questions in the room? To build on that line of conversation, what came to mind for me would be to think about um, risk factors and health challenges such as sexually transmitted infections, which challenge mountain communities, in particular gateway communities and tourism resorts like Bath and Jasper, so that we could embrace a, a larger scope of those kinds of risks and solutions that may pertain directly to population health concerns. We had health in the uh, some health health type um, focus of the research program for the LOI in the previous edition, and so I think that part was kind of removed again to try to try to keep the scope. So we wanted to focus um, rather than on kind of the health pillar, but but on on sort of like the humanities, um, indigenous, and and uh, sort of and sort of science based stuff. So that was I I think that was kind of the decision there, there's a lot of biomedical type of um, projects coming forward and we wanted to try to not do everything. Um, but I mean, I think we're still open to conversation at this point. As a refocus, another way to approach it would be through social services and service delivery in communities so that you can take a social critique perspective on topics like uh, childhood health and or sexually transmitted infections all of these things can be taken up by humanities scholars and social scientists like sociologists and historians as well. And do you see a place within the themes we presented where that could fit within those focal areas at this point? I think at the moment it's lacking and it would be helpful to expose that part of community needs for research and innovation mm -hmm. because at the moment I think uh, it doesn't appear. We don't address poverty too directly here. We don't expose that. Uh, and yet many of the issues that actually face these communities and all of those municipalities and many other smaller settlements 
have to do with poverty, have to do with women and children and what their position is. And if you look at, the, say, the Grand Challenges Canada program, there's a very particular emphasis on things like infant health. Uh, but in a larger sense of how do we improve the lives of, of uh, mothers and families so that infants survive. Uh, these kinds of things tie into concerns like water, but we could also take them as a starting point for drivers toward end goals like pure water. Right. Christy, I can respond to that as well, actually. Uh, really quick, and I think, is that Pearl Ann? Yes. Yes. Oh, hi, Pearl Ann. Ann. Yeah, so, so, um, you know, part of the answer to that question, Pearl Ann, is that it hasn't been brought up necessarily by um, certain stakeholders as their priority within the context of all the things that this, this mountain network could, could be. And that's the reason that it's not necessarily reflected in this current theme piece. However, getting back to the fact or the idea that it is a, it is a uh, end user driven process, one of the areas that I'll point to is this Canadian Mountain Municipalities Consortium. Because although we have these theme areas, the model for the consortium is that we fund it, they do their priorities report, they commission the call for proposals. It goes through our research management committee to make sure that they're rigorous uh, proposals, but they actually select those projects. And so for example, you know, any number of those, those projects that you just put forward, if they genuinely are aligned with community priorities, that would be one mechanism that we've created that is very flexible and that in a sense is somewhat separate from our from our broader uh, uh, theme piece where you could find those kinds of projects whether it's from a research perspective or a knowledge mobilization perspective does that make sense i think we do want to stay open to that and i'm en enthusiastic to hear that matthew uh, if we look to the uh, micro level of local communities uh, agencies like town of banff like ywca they're all in the business of delivering better standards of and quality of life the same for many groups working on reserve um, or with urban populations in mountain places and cities particularly in the core uh, so it does stands out to me that we do not see the word family or children anywhere in the proposal and um, and it is 2017 so uh, i'm wondering if we might stay open enough to those kinds of concerns so that when they do surface in our our research they find a place here uh, for funding as well as for publication and for sharing and partnering and community interaction and community driven research. I think that would be really helpful, Matthew, as you're building your structure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's that's really one of the benefits of this of this consortium model, right? Is it it brings those communities into the driver's seat so that if they don't see pieces that are reflected elsewhere, um, we have that flexibility to respond. So I think I think you're right. I think that's really exciting. I have one other question, and that is, do we embrace, uh, in principle, academic freedom? Could you be more explicit of what's, I'm not an academic myself, so. <laughs> well, it's a question I'll leave for further conversation and dialogue among colleagues and all members and parties of the network. I think this is one of the larger themes of discussion. Uh, currently underway uh, in the in the current context of the political economy of our day pertaining to research and it's mm -hmm. one to think about and certainly one to discuss with our partners and our member groups okay Matthew did you have anything to comment uh, my only comment would be that um, I think you know Perland that's an important issue to raise within this kind of a partnered uh, funding model, right? And so I think, you know, your question is essentially, you know, give a hypothetical example. If there's some kind of a project having to do with the transportation corridor and it's it's funded by a transportation company, uh, you know, within their research partnership, are you, are you still having the flexibility to drive towards the truth and just making sure that any kind of funding agreements don't constrain the outputs? I think, is, is that kind of what you're getting at? That's a good example as okay. a hypothetical. Yeah, I think that's, that's, non-negotiable that's you know required within this within this context for us to have credibility and and no single you know i think a lot of universities have learned this no single agreement 
can uh, can compromise your long-term reputation reputation right any other questions online yes just a second I have two more so once for clarification mm -hmm. have geographical boundaries been set for the research within the Canadian Mountain Network for example, national parks, the Rocky Mountains, or a more national focus? No, no, there, there's, we haven't really defined what a mountain is exactly. And as we said, I think it does affect downstream communities as well. So um, it's really going to be about us scoping out our research agenda, which we've been iteratively doing over the last two years, and then being able to do calls for proposals within, within this research program and also within the consortium and we might have other mechanisms going forward for that as well. Anything on that uh, from you, Matthew? Yeah, no, that's not a, uh, <laughs> that's, that's a common question. And my answer is always, you know, if it, if it looks like, sounds like we're, we're happy for people to self-identify. And so, you know, I think we all have a general sense of, of what are maybe mountain regions across Canada, but um, I'm, you know, we're not going to draw draw a line on the map per se. So for example, Six Sika Nation um, here in Alberta, uh, you know, they're, they're far, far east of, of Calgary. It's a, it's a long way to the mountains and across, you know, across Alberta, that's true of, of, of many different First Nations. And yet these are, these are key cultural sites and, and resource sites and traditional land use sites. And so um, we need to have a broad definition. We need to allow people to self-define and, and um, I don't think we're at a risk of, you know, being exploited through that process. I think ge generally, you know, people, if they're going to put in time and effort, um, they do have a genuine connection and interest and, and we can somewhat, you know, um, I guess circumscribe based on the areas that we're focusing on. But within that, there's a lot of room for fe flexibility. So at the network stage, at, at this stage of the network, better to bring in more people than to, uh, to be overly prescriptive. Perfect. And then we have one more. Will human use, human access, and visitor experience be an area of focus for the research from a sociological perspective, referring to importance of parks enjoyment, education, and culture in accordance with the National Park Act? Um, I, I don't think we're that granular at this point yet. Uh, that'll probably be more, um, more, more details like that will be in the full proposal. Um, certainly, I think a lot of those things we've been touching on in our internal discussions as we're kind of fleshing things out and refining things even further. Um, and this consortium, once again, I think would, could also address a lot of those issues. Matt, yeah, you, you, you can get that. Yeah, I think you can get at that through the land use angle at a, at a very broad, you know, at a, at a very high level through this, you know, sustainable mountain community development piece that Harold has, has reminded us that needs to be better represented there. I think you could fit, you could fit that in as well. Okay, we have about 25 minutes left, but we don't have to go that far if there are no other questions. Okay, so this isn't the end of the conversation. If anyone has further comments or questions, again, our online form is always there and you can certainly give us a call at the office, set up an appointment to chat online or in person. Um, I just want to thank everybody who presented today and also all of our planners here who um, supported us uh, administratively um, to make this happen today. Um, uh, we have a great uh, team of interns as well as our Kathy and uh, this team has been able to have them and I think we're pretty flawless technically so that's um, not an easy feat to be honest. <laughs> um, and thank you everyone for coming as well and sharing your ideas and thoughts. This is a really complex thing we're trying to do and we're we're really trying to make something great and um, I'm really happy once again to meet with anyone privately afterwards to get, you know, to flesh out some of your ideas more and make sure that they're they're part of what we're trying to achieve. So, any anything else from uh, from Leo? No, Matthew. No, that's great. Thank you very much, everyone. There were some really good ideas here, and I think we are going to be able to uh, to iterate this proposal. And a reminder to everyone online as well. Um, that we will have a video recording of this as well. So we'll be able to, we'll be putting that online by the end of today and then uh, sending it out to everybody so you can share it with, um, with your colleagues uh, and, and others and then get back to us. So thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs>
so um, here we'll just let us know when it's 